Hello. Hello. Good morning. Layer one focus. Um, so uh, just a few things before we hit off with Vitalik's presentation. So um, if you guys have any feedback on the working groups or the structure of the presentations or anything at all, let Jing, myself, or Makira know. Um, it might not be us planning it next year, but the feedback will be passed on to whoever to ensure productive research sessions. Um, second thing is, uh, as we mentioned, the whole thing was free. Um, there's no cost, but we really want you guys to share your research and anything that came out of this week. Um, so we have a Scaling Ethereum publication on Medium that you guys could directly post to. Or if you post something else, we can link that on the website um, in our required slash recommended reading. Um, that would be awesome. I know especially in day one and day two, there was a lot going on. Even if it's problems that um, you know, are dead ends, that's valuable research to share with people who might be doing something along the same path. Um, and third thing is um, clean up after yourself. You guys already know this. And have a great last day. Okay, thank you. Um, so today what I wanted to talk talk about is just go through some of the kind of motivations and uh, trade-offs behind uh, kind of designing uh, fa the phase two um, specification for Ethereum uh, for or ETH2 specifically. Um, so for to just give a kind of quick background and people probably already know this, but Ethereum 2.0 is kind of split into these three phases at first, where you start off with phase zero, which is creating just the beacon chain, which has a proof of stake, and it can hold in, uh, hold itself in consensus, but it doesn't really let you do much um, anything except like transfer um, tr transfer ether with like, very low transactions per second rates. Um, phase one adds uh, shards. Um, but in phase one, the shards are data only. So the system basically keeps track of uh, Merkle roots of uh, shard, of collections of shard blocks. And the consensus is meant to verify that the shard blocks are available, but it doesn't do anything in terms of managing state, computation, code, execution, smart contracts, or any of those things. And phase two is meant to add state and add code execution. And phase two is the point at which Ethereum 2.0 is meant to kind of turn into a broadly usable system and like actually kind of achieve what seems to be the, well, well, the goal of creating a scalable Ethereum-like system. Um, so start off by talking about the goals. So what are the goals of having phase two? Why not uh, just stop at phase one? Um, so what can phase one do, right? Um, so it turns out that there are things that you can do with uh, just phase one um, on top of, uh, so with just uh, shards having data and a, a non-scalable computation layer. Uh, so if you just have data, then you can make a decentralized Twitter where you can just throw tweets onto the blockchain. And like, uh, Transaction fees will fall options that have to do with publishing data on the blockchain. So one of one of them might be using uh, the data in the sharded chains to store information about like key and certificate revocation. You could imagine it uh, storing data like kind of very high, very high level, uh, kind of high value, small amounts of data that different kinds of applications might need. You could imagine it just hosting JavaScript pages or JavaScript and HTML for dApps, like just small and me basically small and medium amounts of just actual storage, right? So the sharded chain is expected to provide about uh, 10 meg provide and come to consensus on about 10 megabytes per second of data, and there's a lot that you can do with uh, 10 megabytes per second, right? So that's one example of something that you can do. Um, Another example of um, a thing that you can do with phase one is 
you can build kind of like different kinds of architectures for quote enterprise chains where you rely on the public chain as a data availability guaranteeing layer but then for example you could have all of the transactions be encrypted and then you could require people to run special nodes and put in decryption keys and actually process these transactions in order to compute what the state of the system is right so you could come up with systems where you use the yeah, kind of public blockchain to se provide security for data but then you do kind of other private things on top of it and if you do this then you get certain kind of non-censorship and non-tampering guarantees from from the uh, public chain uh, but without uh, needing to use any kind of computation functionality of the public chain and without a lot of the costs of kind of fully publicifying whatever your application is. So that's another thing that you can do. Um, a third thing that you can do is uh, ZK rollup. Uh, so if you have uh, a, um, Z uh, a chain with uh, 10 megabytes a second of uh, data availability, then you can make a ZK rollup like system um, where instead of the data that sh that says what your state transitions are uh, being in the main chain, the data would just be put into the shard chain, and then you would have a ZK snark that basically proves here's the old state root, here's the new state root, here is a Merkle uh, proof pointing to a shard block that contains data, here's a snark proving that the old uh, state root plus that, um, plus that data gives you the new state root, and that data, instead of being uh, um, in the ETH1 chain, would be in this much more scalable layer. And so the transactions per second that you can get with ZK rollup schemes is uh, um, plus uh, data availability theoretically is actually like, extremely massive. So standard ZK rollup requires about 10 bytes per transaction, 10 bytes per transaction, 10, meg uh, 10 megabytes per second of data availability. So we're literally talking about 1 million TPS. Well, assuming, of course, you have like really, really good uh, proof, like uh, zero knowledge proving hardware to actually make that that amount of proofs. Um, if you want to do ZK, ZK rollup, so this is the flavor of ZK rollup where the state that's happening, uh, transitions that are happening inside the system are themselves Zcash like transactions, then it goes down from a million TPS to uh, a relatively tiny like tens of thousands to 100,000 TPS. So like it, ZK rollup type things are on top of a data availability layer are an extremely powerful primitive and there are a lot of really neat things that you can do with them. So phase one by itself seems pretty strong, right? So what can't it do? Um, so I guess first of all, like what do we want to do, right? So the goal that I kind of intuitively feel people have with ETH2 is to kind of deliver a maximally ETH1-like developer experience, but with uh, 1,024 times more scalability. Um, and another goal is the transition to proof of stake and basically get rid of the proof of work chain, stop issuing Ether to miners, and get the stability and performance of the proof of stake chain for all, all of the applications. Right. Now, what do we need? Basically, in order to achieve this goal, what we need is some form of computational scalability, right? So real Ethereum applications use both, uh, both data and computation pretty heavily. And so intuitively, you need infrastructure to do a large quantity, so a quantity larger than any single computer can handle of computation and also some form of state storage and not just data. So you need compu we need scalable computation and we are going to do a scalable data availability, availability layer regardless, but there's actually a lot of different ways of getting uh, scalable computation on top of this, right? Um, so phase two trade-off spectrum here, right? So we can think of this as this spectrum between doing less at consensus, at consensus layer or at least at kind of scalable consensus layer versus doing more um, in the shards. And at the very left here, we have basically the shards being data only, right? So all computation happens right now in the proof of work chain, but, but if we want to get rid of proof of work, then the computation moves over to the beacon chain. So we have computation happening in the beacon chain and shards are completely data only. So things that we can do, uh, ZK rollups, yay. 
Um, now, what are the weaknesses of ZK rollups? Basically, one of them is that proving is pretty inefficient and uh, hard, um, especially for general purpose computation. So especially once you start talking about snarking or even uh, starking the EVM, then like even though the blockchain theoretically can give you 100,000 TPS, getting that in practice would require a huge ASIC market. And it's very plausible that the just computational resource cost of making a proof on general purpose computation just is going to be even 10 or 100 times harder than the cost of the transaction fee to put this thing onto a blockchain. So this is, that's probably the main challenge. Um, there is one alternative to a ZK rollup that has kind of similar but weaker properties that um, kind of bypasses the need to make proofs. And this is um, an idea I actually had back in 2014 that I had put on a blog post and then completely forgot about it. And now it turns out, yay, it's actually relevant again. Um, this is called Shadow Chains, um, basically um, because back then we were supposed to have cool names for things. Um, Shadow chains basically is this, like, the simplest way to think about it is it's like ZK rollup, except instead of using ZK snarks to prove state transitions, you have a true bit, like, interactive verification game to prove uh, state transitions. And the main two weaknesses that this has, one is that exiting from the system instead of being instant has to have a two-week window in case this, uh, the state transition was uh, done incorrectly and you have to challenge it. And there's also this kind of mass challenge vulnerability that you have to work around of like, what if the, someone tries to get a DOS the system and kind of prevents, uh, prevents some part of the system from being challenged. But um, also you're kind of putting a lot of things on top of uh, chain liveness requirements. So, so you inherit kind of a lot of the disadvantages that current, uh, current layer two uh, systems have as well. But if we wanted to do this, we could do this, right? If we wanted to do this, we could just like do this some kind of shadow chain um, architecture. Um, and basically just create an Ethereum 2.0 like system with state routes that are being calculated on the beacon chain, where you just have this, this kind of complicated game for rolling back state routes that you discover are based on in incorrect computation. So, this is a thing that you can do, right? So that's the left side of the spectrum. Now let's take one step to the right in the spectrum here. We can do pure function about a very limited kind of computation, which is pure function evaluation and commitments to pure functions being evaluated on shard data. So what do I mean by this, right? What I mean basically is that you can, uh, instead of the system just um, having uh, a, agreeing on blocks and agreeing on the fact that blocks contain data and that data is available, you can have a system that also says, here's data, here's the, the, the data is available, and here is a 32 byte output, which is the result of computing some function on the data, where the function itself could be just a piece of WASM code and you could just stick that WASM code wherever. So, Basically, shard blocks commit to some arbitrary reduction function, a function from the block data to the block contents, their WASM code. Now, the interesting thing about this approach is that it, uh, it adds computa computation capabilities to the sharding system, but it literally does not change the model at all in some sense, right? So what I mean by that is that checking reduction functions of data is something we do already because we have the shard block header already contains the hash tree root of the data. The hash tree root itself is a reduction function. And part of the process of verifying the shard chain system is verifying that the data ha hashes to the thing that it claims to hash to in the header. So if we are already ver like evaluating functions on data and checking them against numbers that you stick into a header, well, why not have other functions and let people put their own functions and then uh, allow blocks to uh, commit to the fact that some function evaluated on data is some number that you put in a header. And if you add this one bit of computation to the system, then you gain the ability to do kind of roll up like techniques basically without having to do either Starks or Snarks or kind of this uh, shadow chain true bit based approach. So 
let's explore like how would you concretely build this kind of system, right? So what you would basically, the question is how would you build a usable scalable smart contract layer on top of just phase one plus the ability to have blocks that commit to reduction functions of data. So here's one approach, right? So you have a smart contract on the beacon chain where the smart contract for every shard stores a state root and a last process slot. And then the contract accepts a Merkle proof of a beacon chain block. So the Merkle proof has to prove that the beacon chain block actually was accepted. It actually was included in the beacon, uh, sorry, um, Merkle proofs of, sorry, this is wrong. Merkle proofs of accepted shard chain blocks. So you have to add a Merkle proof that says, here is a shard chain block. Look, this shard chain block actually got accepted in the beacon chain. Look, here is a proof that points to a crosslink. Um, it checks that, first of all, the slot is um, the slot that's um, in this block is k plus 1. Um, then it checks uh, that the reduction function um, runs the block as a stateless client, and it basically outputs, here is the pre-state, here is the post-state, right? So the reduction function basically would just interpret the first 32 bytes of block data as being the previous state root. And when you run this, uh, tr the transition function in the, in, the in the beacon chain contract, it would check, hey, does this shard chain block specify the correct state root? If not, then you just ignore it. And you pretend that block kind of never, basically never happened. Then if the uh, first 32 bytes of the block actually are the pre-state, then you would run copy, basically pretends that the rest of the block is essentially a, um, a kind of stateless client Merkle proof doing some state transitions containing transactions and containing the witnesses for them. So you would evaluate the some transaction. Beacon chain says, well, if the pre-state is correct, then you just set the state root to the post-state. Um, just pause and check how many people understand this. Okay. Um, so this actually works, right? So this is extremely surprising, but basically with phase one plus computation on the beacon chain, so just like move the ETH1 system over onto the beacon chain, you can get um, the ability to execute scalable sharded things pretty nicely and at like very low consensus complexity. So we can like pretty much pack our bags and say we're done like literally like a week from now. So yay. Now what is the weakness of this, right? So the weakness is that I would argue that this is just inefficient, right? So it, um, by the way, how much time do I have? Huh? Eight? Okay. So the main weakness of this is that it kind of inefficiently does things on the beacon chain. It basically, the problem is that you just have these Merkle branches from shard chains that you just have to keep on moving, move, publishing onto the beacon chain. There's this computation that's being done onto the beacon chain. There's all this data. It has to, the beacon chain either has to store a whole bunch of state roots or it has to verify a whole bunch of, and hold a whole bunch of extra Merkle roots. So, it's technically kind of scalable, but like in the asymptotic sense, but it's really not efficient. So then you go one step to the right, right? And on the one step to the right, basically you have this kind of reducer function where instead of being a pure function on data, you allow kind of state to be threaded through um, at the shard level. And this is the proposal that I talked about two weeks ago, where you have your execution environments, you have your state in the execution environments. Um, we can extend it further, and we can allow, we can kind of create functionality for um, depositing into these execution environments, withdrawing from these execution environments. So basically, like the thing that we've been we've been talking about, where you have co uh, you, you do have functions that are being ex that are being used to process uh, blocks and the, or that are being used to process shards or shard blocks, but these functions are allowed to carry this tiny amount of state and kind of thread it through between blocks. And where the, the, this tiny amount of state basically is the state roots of the kind of actual uh, actual state of the system that people are supposed to keep track of. And then the actual ether gets all, all kind of at the bottom level gets held 
owned by the execution environments on the beacon chain and then the shard chains or the execution environment itself can kind of define itself in ways that allow users inside of the system to have claims on the ether that that execution environment controls. So basically we're moving from pure functions to these reducer functions that thread state through. Um, iterating more, um, state and shards. So this is the proposal I made three weeks ago where instead of uh, be having reducer functions, you would have WASM execution that has access to the state of, sh or a region of state in shards and the ability to get and set to it as a foreign function interface. So doing more at consensus layer and then doing like all necessary logic at consensus layer. So this basically means at consensus layer, you kind of define the full Ethereum 2.0 system. You define how accounts work. You define how the user abstraction schemes work. You define how cross shard communication works. Like you define pretty much everything. And you basically take this kind of mono, this, the same sort of monolithic kernel approach that Ethereum 1.0 took. So this is basically what the kind of spectrum is, right? Between kind of doing less and more. So the trade-offs, as far as I can tell, um, on the left side of doing less, a simpler implementation of the consensus layer. So consensus people can kind of, go, um, you, consensus US, not consensus YS, yeah. can go home and retire more quickly. And consensus <laughs> YS people have to work harder to actually build stuff on top. <laughs> um, now, Another interesting benefit that's kind of surfaced recently is um, that you can, with more abstracted models, it's easier to kind of slot in the Ethereum one state transition function while leaving room for um, improving it and making alternatives and competing with it in the future. Uh, so you can base, uh, and then on the right side, basically um, having a monolithic system potentially has less total complexity. Um, basically because instead of having the abstraction layer, then the thing built on the abstraction layer, then the glue, you can kind of take out the glue. So if there only is one thing that people want to do on top of the abstraction layer, then it might make sense to just make it be monolithic. Um, less risk of uh, fragmentation between execution environments. So there, so if so you have a highly abstracted thing, then you get this risk that, oh, what if a fifth of people are using the ETH1 state transition engine, a uh, fifth of people are using some new and improved ETH2 one that Justin came up with, um, a fifth of people are doing ZK rollup, a fifth of people are doing shadow chains, and another fifth of people are running some weird enterprise thing, then like, you lose developer network even though you're sharing one system. Um, also, there is this question of like which upgrade path is easier. Is it easier to coordinate on a hard fork or is it easier to coordinate on like getting everyone to uh, application developers to move from one execution environment to another execution environment? So there's like arguments on both sides and this is one of the things that we could talk about. Um, last question, um, how do we actually fit ETH1 into all of this, right? So this is the question of like, how much do we care about ETH1 and what, like basically what level of transition costs do we impose on existing application developers? Uh, so on the left side of the spectrum, this is like the most extreme and crazy approach is basically what we're going to do is we're going to say, we will starting from Jul um, the 4th of July, 2023, because that, that, and that'll be our independence day from the evils of proof of work. Um, <laughs> we, we will just for start to forget the proof of work chain exists. And so before the 4th of July, 2023, um, everyone has to take their ether and move it into the ETH2 system through uh, some whatever contract. And so all applications on the ETH1 side just have to shut down before then. Users have to move all their stuff over. Application developers just have to start from scratch on the ETH2 side. So this is like maximum disruption, um, but like also minimum need to care about backwards compatibility. Um, this is like a bit further toward ETH1 surviving um, and kind of continuing to be relevant. So here, the ETH1 proof of work chain eventually dies. But what happens is that you take the state root of ETH1 when the proof of work chain dies and you move it into a contract inside of ETH2. And that contract in ETH2 basically would maintain a stateless client and it would end 
it would allow ETH1 transactions to keep happening, and it would also allow withdrawal functionality where if you send Ether to some address, it can kind of push out the Ether on the ETH2 side. So no hard migration requirements. Nobody suffers if they go into a Chroma for five years, but ETH1 survives only as a kind of second class citizen. Um, care about ETH1 a bit more. So here the ETH1 uh, chain, uh, proof of work chain dies, but instead of becoming a contract, it becomes an execution environment. So here, ETH1 survives even more, and it arguably survives as a first-class citizen. So ETH1 would play basically the same role that any um, inside of the ETH2 system that any future execution environment plays, and it possibly becomes the near-term dominant execution environment. If you are a dApp, no explicit migration required at all. Um, if you are a user, you could probably just keep running a full node, and at some point the full node will just switch from tracking the old thing to tracking the new thing. And you could just totally, potentially, if we engineer correctly, not notice anything happened at all. Um, even more, um, let's say instead of the um, uh, ETH1 proof of work chain moving to an execution environment, how about instead it moves into the beacon chain? So I would argue that this has theoretically no benefits because, well, if you 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 have you have stay like this thing, and we already have infrastructure in the shards for running state transitions, and like you gain nothing from having fifty thousand nodes run this instead of having you know, like a one thousand node run it inside of shards, right? So, arguably, there's not really much benefit to this now. If we want to take the kind of maximally abstracted approach where shard chains only have data and, data and reduction functions, then we would have to do this. But if we're taking kind of one step to the right, then ETH1 can just be an execution environment. Um, the costs of this approach, though, are the load on the beacon chain becomes really high because ETH1 is like honestly a pretty bulky and not the, not the most efficient system. Um, higher consensus complexity, the beacon chain is likely to have a four times higher block time than shards, so not the best. And then the entire sharding system being built around the existing ETH1 proof of work chain, which was kind of the original proposal. So the original proposal was to do this and then migrate the, proof of, the ETH1 proof of work chain over to hybrid Casper and eventually full Casper. I would argue theoretically no benefits unless you like proof of work. Um, and like, it's just going uh, an approach that just will end up taking, taking much longer and will lead to uh, like higher consensus complexity. But like, these are my own opinions. So I'd argue that like this is the happy medium, and by coincidence, it's the third thing in a list of five. Um, yay, um, centrism is always correct. <laughs> um, yeah, so in terms of like problems to talk about, um, one of one of the thing the things that we can talk about later today is coming up with kind of more detailed analysis of what the relevance trade-offs are. Um, another is to, like, in the case of that we choose to use more abstract, that we choose to use more abstracted designs that do less of consensus layer, figure out concrete approaches for implementing certain desired things on top of them. So one example of um, concrete things that we can talk about are fast asynchronous transactions, synchronous transactions. We can talk about other forms of abstraction, signatures, replay mechanisms, fees, state models, privacy. Um, another thing, we think through asynchronous programming in a shorted context. So think through what it would can, can concretely look like to be a developer in this um, sharded environment. Um, think through how to kind of cross shardify. Look at programming language features for Solidity and Viper. What would you need to add? Um, go through a list of popular dApps, tokens, NFTs, Uniswap, Maker, Augur. Figure out what, what they would look like in sharded land. Um, move toward developing a kind of sharded ERC-20 replacement standard. So basically just sketch out more concretely what kind of the sharded world will look like. Thank you. <laughs> yes? Uh, so when ETH, if ETH1 is its own execution environment mm -hmm. and contracts can just run in there, Will they have any idea of like cross contract or cross shard? Mm, contract good course? question. Uh, so this is an implementation choice. Um, there's two ways to do this, right? I mean, one of them is if we want, like, if we're just doing this as temporary backwards compatibility and we want to force everyone to migrate away from the ETH1 environment as soon as possible, then 
all we would do is we would make the ETH1 environments just live inside one shard, not be scalable, and the only functionality we would hard fork in is, is the ability to move Ether away and to like talk kind of cross um, do a bit of cross execution environment um, talking. Um, if we want ETH1 to have some more long term sustainability and take a more an evolutionary path, then you could imagine 1,024 copies of, ETH1, of the ETH1 environment being created. So basically, it would exist on every shard. And there, but there would only be one shard where the current ETH1 state would be pre-mined in. On the other 1,023 shards, it would be completely empty. Uh, and if uh, that happens, uh, then like, basically, we would need to add in like basic cross shard functionality to it so just cross contract calling cross contract yanking and that would probably be enough and people can like i ex i don't my intuition is that it that would not disrupt existing applications but it would kind of enable new ones but the, another thing to talk over what happens for things that like depend on the proof work? so what happens like for example what my contract uses block not difficulty mm. what, what, what happens in here yeah, good question. I mean, the simplest answer is that it would just start seeing the number 2 to the 33 forever. Um, yeah. Yes. Um, actually, no, sorry. The other thing I want to mention is that um, the other kind of um, environment opcode compatibility challenge is that anyone who makes an assumption that um, the block number opcode roughly corresponds to timestamp times uh, times 13 is going to have to like deal with that not being true anymore. But yeah, yes. Just a quick, th there's a middle ground, which is we can just throw up a contract that says, hey, you're on proof of work. And then when we fork, we'll, we just pre-commit socially, we're going to flip that bit. So if you want to write conditional code that says after I'm on this, whatever, check this, mm -hmm. then, then you can figure out your own logic for transitioning. I think it'd be pretty cheap. Yeah. Ooh, um, here's a uh, fun one. We um, have a contract where you can submit proof of work solutions for fun. <laughs> mm. Yes. How quickly can you get cross shard transactions guaranteed? Optimist. Um, how quick? So, like, how quickly can you like move, do things for? So, like, optimistic. at layer. Oh, optimistic. Uh, one block. It should be. Yeah, but like we can talk about this more in this workshop that's supposed to exist apparently. Mm. Uh huh. Yes. Do you think that as you move away from proof of work, there will be some proof of work maximalists out there that hard fork themselves? Um, I believe the strategy is to convince these people to join Ethereum Classic because they have an existing community of people who like proof of work. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, Virtual's been pretty friendly with them lately, so good work. <laughs> Yes. Just want to go back to currency when you're talking about the threads. Uh huh. How we um how does how does that because if you have multiple threads, um, uh -huh. how do they map to shard chains? Uh, so the idea is that every sh like by default kind of every thread or execution environment or like hypervisor or whatever you call it would ha exist and have state and theoretically be usable from every shard, and so it would have a 32 byte state root for every shard, and so a block on a shard would be able to specify either, well, the simplest approach is a block on a shard specifies the one execution environment that it's using for that shard, in which case it would just look into the shard state and see what is the most recent uh, state root for that execution environment and then adjust it. The other option that seems to be popular is to allow blocks to contain like multiple kind of partitions for multiple um, execution environments. Um, you know. So it'd be like the the instruction set lives on the bacon chain mm -hmm. and it is executed. Yeah, the yeah, level. yeah. Code lives on the beacon chain, execution happens in the shards. Mm -hmm. Option five still gets you the proof of stake just longer. Yes, yes, what it can. Like, no. mm -hmm. Isn't it a better idea to, like, you know, not try to do two crazy things at once and instead, like, stagger them? It Well, <coughs> it depends, right? Because, like, our community is big at this point, so we'll, like, why not get gains from paralyzing would be one answer. Um, arguably, yeah. And then like the other thing is that you there's a lot of benefits that you would just kind of not get in the meantime. Um, so, like for example, 
in order to have sharding, you pretty much have to have proof of stake because it's harder to make sharding be secure with proof of work. But then if you have proof of stake, then there's less point in running the proof of work thing. Yeah. Yes. Can you move back to the spectrum with the your function and the reduction function? Mm -hmm. uh, can you clarify, like, in, on the spectrum, where the verification of actual transactions take place, like, on, on the shards? Or um, are we talking about option two or option three? Uh, so what's the difference between option, option two? two and option two is just like the 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 system uh, verifies evaluations of pure functions on a block data, and option three is it evalu it verifies evaluations on reducer functions, which basically means that you're allowed to kind of thread some state through between blocks on the shard. Um, so in this system, like the ac in in option two, the kind of heavy duty like there needs to be a lot of like heavy duty logic happening. Um, in smart contract execution on the beacon chain. And so you have these kind, of, these kind of gadgets that exist on the beacon chain whose purpose is to kind of manage this system which is which facilitates execution happening on shards. But and okay, so more concretely, right, let's say we have a transaction where like, let's say we have a mixer and you 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 and you send send one eth into the mixer and you, you like then you you and you take money out. So in order for this to happen, there need to be six, like the mixer needs to be published and there need to be six instances of people putting data on the blockchain and six instances of something being run, right? So in terms of like who would be acting on each, uh, uh, in all cases, so all six times the data would be on, it would be put onto shards. Um, the actual execution, so verifying the zero knowledge proofs, verifying the deposits, um, w transactions, like that would be that would happen as part of running either the pure functions or the reducer functions. Mm -hmm. So the reducer function would basically have logic that says for every like interpret the block as a list of transactions and Merkle and a Merkle proof. And for every transaction, I just run whatever the transaction like, uh, says to run. And so basically that would, like your like one of those transactions would be, hey, I want to take money out of this mixer. And so the transaction would say, or the, the verification code would like actually run the EVM code, like the EVM or EWASM or whatever code of the transaction. And then that would contain logic that says, hey, run these things that correspond to verifying a, verifying a snark. It would just do that. And it would, the outputs of that would just all go into the state route that it pushes out at the end. So this evaluation takes place on the shards? Um, yes. Yeah. So in terms of who does this, it's done by default by the shard committees. Yeah, it's, it, and then the results are pushed on the the, the results the, the results are pushed as a state route onto um, in this um, in this case um, uh, onto the beacon chain. In this case, they just stay as part of shard state. I see. So we, we always operate on one shard. We can only take data from one shard. And maybe Not one necessarily, state. right? So the idea, well, the idea is that each of these systems would, yeah. So the execution kind of individually operates on one shard, except. Like you can give these functions access to historical data, like beacon chain routes, and they can use that to verify receipts from other shards. Mm -hmm. Yes. And which options allow you to combine both the crossing community and the shard community? Good question. Um, if we want to do this, then basically two and three. Um, the reason is that four would just make it too expensive to um, switch between. Uh, uh, like four makes means that you have to do a fast sync every time you switch committees, which basically means the committees have to last at least a week or whatever it is. Hmm. Yes, Carl. Where are you leaning in this uh, chart? Because you didn't give. A oh, on this chart, I didn't give a happy medium. Um, I mean, the last proposal I gave was three. Um, I I mean, two feels mathematically more pure, but three feels practically more better. But, mm. Yes. You know where Polkadot's design falls on the spectrum? Huh. I'm. 
I mean, they definitely ha- they, they definitely have data shards. They definitely have like some kind of function evaluation. They probably have state and shards as well. So, I I don't know the details. If I had to guess, I'd say four. Mm-hmm. It's like if you had a one-to-one match of execution Okay. But right. So then, but like, do are there in Polkadot? Are there do nodes uh, kind of bounce bounce around between like, VR flying execution yes. environments? Yes. Okay. Uh, Mm-hmm. And it is a wasm function. And it is a wasm function, and yeah. the nodes do keep track of like the state, the state. So when they bounce around, they have to fast sync the new thing. In that case, it's four. Okay. Yay! Continue on the work you shot over. Okay, these two, and then I can just click. All right, cool. Um, so I actually will uh, compare uh, some of the current design um, suggestions to Polkadot. Uh, so I'll go into that a little bit. Yeah. Um, and in general, there are three talks this morning around phase two. Uh, so after myself, uh, Casey from EWASM is going to talk about it as well. And so there are kind of three, I guess, different uh, different perspectives to share on on the proposal. Um, so yeah, um, and again, this talk this morning is about what the design space is currently, uh, mainly about uh, Vitalik's latest proposal, um, giving some concrete examples and various things and um, explaining some of the work that uh, we're specifically doing to help support the efforts around this. So all of this is an open space um, and still being discussed and um, but the main talk of, or the main goal of this talk is to give a general, um, I guess, explanation of everything. Um, so first of all, uh, right now it's uh, myself and Matt. We're part of a team called Quilt. Matt, if you can stand up and raise your hand or something. Yeah. And so we, um, uh, our, our purpose is to help with the specification, uh, prototype, iterate, benchmark, um, and uh, help uh, you know bring community involvement as much as possible towards work around phase two. And we are um, a part of R&D in consensus. Um, so I'm the next few slides, uh, you guys are all very smart. And so I imagine um, I'll be repeating things that you already know. But I think it will be really cool to give kind of a foundational understanding of things that can help share the story of what the current proposal is. Um, so the story of sharded chains. So uh, we started off, uh, Bitcoin uh, showed a strong use case of underlying technology, POW. Um, Ethereum came along, provided flexibility um, and uh, smart contracts, general smart contracts in general, which um, really it seemed like uh, developers. To prove a lot of amazing concepts that have not been tried before. Um, and then eventually, uh, these systems reach capacity. Um, and so there was discussion of a number of uh, solutions to go ahead and augment that. Um, so layer two, state channels, plasma, um, continued research around this. Um, one of the things is, uh, I guess, Im- immediately once this space opened up, um, one of the things that um, was realized is uh, there's still continued work on figuring out how do you write general smart contracts in these systems. And general smart contracts have been helpful. Uh, developers have tended to enjoy them, and it's created a good developer experience. Um, there are predicates that's being worked on and a lot of amazing work. So um, I believe um, a version of that is coming. Um, and then bridges. There's a talk of bridges. You had XDI, POS, POA chains. Uh, the emergence of Tendermint and Cosmos, um, and uh, yeah. So in general, there were some issues with bridges. Um, the, the main issue, and actually uh, there was a talk yesterday by Ben that talked about this, which is the weakest link problem. Um, and that generally means your security around an asset and the, uh, the execution around that asset can be bounded by the security of the mid chain. And this may apply both ways. 
Um, so the solution that came together, of course, is sharding and disgust. Um, so in a sharding system, you have shared security. Um, so in general, let's just do like an illustration in a normal POS chain. Let's just say for a random number we'll throw out, which is a thousand validators. Um, the idea, uh, if you want to corrupt, then you can take, take uh, control of two thirds of those um, and you have 666 to attack. Uh, in a shard system, you can kind of distribute this security and make it much more economically difficult. So you can multiply that by um, a factor of n. Uh, and so what's cool is when you kind of have a shared model in sharding, um, you can have fast shuffling and improvements. And um, you no longer have this issue when you bridge, um, or you can consider cross-shard transactions or communication of uh, decreased security from one uh, chain to another, or one shard to another, since you're within a shared security model. And that's really powerful. That's really cool. Um, and so, uh, you know, we look at ETH1, um, for example. And so um, I guess when you compare this space of the new proposal, you can think of ETH1 as having um, one hard-coded uh, transaction or execution framework um, or execution engine. Uh, so there's one execution environment. If you want to change that, um, then you need to do a fork. Uh, so let's just do a quick example. Um, in current Ethereum, a transaction looks like this, nonce gas price limit to value data. Um, you do RLP hash, and then you go ahead and sign it with your private key. Um, now, if you wanted to change the structure of that, if you wanted to change the uh, encoding schema, uh, the signing schema, um, or any of those fields in the transaction, that's going to require a fork. Um, so yeah, updating requires a fork or a hard fork of some sort. Um, so in, in ETH1, for example, you don't have more than one execution uh, framework or execution environment. You have one. Um, and uh, similarly, if you want to change your account structure, so uh, the account structure in ETH1, um, nonce balance storage root code hash, again, you would need to go ahead and do a fork to make, make that change. Um, so yeah, that's just uh, another uh, summary of that. Um, so going into ETH2, we have the three major phases. So phase zero is the beacon chain, um, which uh, ultimately is about um, setting check-ins from the charge chains, um, establishing finality, um, which enables this shared security model, um, giving validator rules, um, who proposes certain blocks, et cetera, et cetera. Um, phase one is the development of the shard chains. Uh, Vitalik gave a really good um, overview of this, uh, and this being a data layer. Uh, phase two is when you can bring a lot of utility out of the first two phases, and this is where you bring in state execution. Um, so I'm going to start off with a general fun example, and then I'll um, narrow in to be technical. Um, so I, I think, you know, we'll kind of go from outside and, and dive in a bit deeper. So I'm going to use an example of universe clusters and galaxies. Um, so you have clusters of galaxies. Um, so and, and this is, again, this describes what um, I think this is the third uh, item that um, uh, Vitalik was pointing to. Um, so that's, that's what this uh, example provides. And um, again, this is all open design space right now. Uh, so ETH2, let's consider the universe. Uh, let's consider a shard, a cluster of galaxies. So in this case, we have 1024 clusters. Um, and let's say an execution environment is a galaxy. Uh, so within its galaxy, it can have um, all of its own transactions and smart contracts that all communicate with each other synchronously um, and operate with each other. Um, so that's, that's uh, my definition there. Um, so here we have a cluster of galaxies. And so let's say we're in a shard and um, I say, let's be creative for a moment and think about what different execution environments we may have. Um, so we could have ETH1 that we already talked about. Uh, let's say we have a UTXO execution environment. Uh, let's say there's some generalized L2 check-in um, that is compatible with, let's say, a roll-up or other different model and how you pay to get the uh, data into that layer. Um, let's say we have an account model um, that we've kind of, the community has stood by for ETH2. Um, and then this is kind of a creative and fun one. Let's say you have an execution environment around um, uh, data models, machine learning models that you can upload and uh, just give it data that it produces the prediction. 
Um, and so uh, some power that can come from this, what's really cool is, um, oh, actually, let me go back. And the cool thing is, um, at least in the current proposal, um, the idea is that all these different systems should be able to communicate with each other synchronously um, within one shard. And so this becomes really cool because let's say we decide that we want to pull out ERC-20 tokens um, or just token framework in general as its own execution environment. Uh, you can now have access to that from an ETH1 execution environment, from a UTXO execution environment, from a new account model that the community stands behind. Um, that becomes powerful and, and it's, it's, it's pretty cool. And you could uh, imagine being able to do that with, uh, um, with some of these other systems as well. If you have a um, machine learning models or you have um, uh, other, other pieces that uh, all the execution environments can, can share and communicate with synchronously. Um, more examples, uh, we could bring interpreters um, as an execution environment, as long as they're built in WASM. Um, you could begin to build TEEs, secure, secure enclaves, um, uh, oracles. Uh, so you could have shared oracle networks. So that's another thing um, that's a good example um, if you want to share an oracle network across different execution environments. Um, and then what's interesting, at, at least in the current proposal, um, and again, all these things you know, could, could theoretically change. Um, once you have an execution environment, that execution environment may live um, and can live on all the shards, all 1024 shards, unless it restricts itself, as an example. Um, and then cross-cluster or cross-shard communication, um, you can assume will be asynchronous. Um, and the rules behind that will be defined in the execution environment, and I'll talk about that in a little bit more depth in a moment. Uh, so just a quick review, there's 1024 shards. All execution environments can live on every shard. Um, synchronous communication within a shard uh, between execution environments and asynchronous across shards. Um, and rules are defined in the execution environment. So let's uh, dive a little bit deeper. So Vitalik talk, talked about this, um, which is awesome. So uh, we now introduce uh, this concept uh, or could introduce this concept of um, the beacon chain storing a set of pure reducing functions. Um, and these pure reducing functions are basically the rules by which transactions or these execution environments operate under. Um, so let's start off with an example. So um, in ETH1, you could consider um, this, uh, you, you have a pre-state S, um, you have a block of a set of transactions, and really what's pumped out is um, a post-state S prime. Um, and then if we look at a, what a reducing function might be and we create a stateless system, um, we could have a root hash or a state hash here to a post-state hash. And so you could almost think of ETH1, um, there just being this pure reducing function on the beacon chain that transforms pre-state root hash to post-state root hash prime in this case. So then let's uh, look at the beacon chain. Um, so let's say we have one uh, um, execution environment, that pure reducing function that defines ETH1. That's the first one. The second one defines this UTXO environment. Um, and the third one defines this account-based um, model. And so um, e in each of these, we have a root hash, pre-root hash, and a post-root hash. Um, and you can consider these as independent reducing functions, uh, generally peer reducing functions. Um, so uh, I don't know. Um, so in, in this case, you can basically define what your state might look like in the stateless model, however you like. So for example, we have a Patricia Merkel tree in the current uh, Ethereum ETH1 environment, um, and that may iterate to other things. Um, as the like most simplest example, Let's say you just had a key value storage of just accounts with value that enables transfers. Um, EWASM, so uh, just get everyone on the same page. Um, so uh, state execution happens in, in this model within the consensus of each shard. Um, and everything is based in EWASM. Um, you can assume EWASM is a subset of WASM, um, building metering and concept of gas, including a number of host runtime functions to node specific operations. So if you need to access shard slot, shard number, slot number, uh, pieces from the beacon chain, um, these are runtime uh, functions and calls. Uh, so in, in, 
This situation, uh, just to show a little bit of code, and uh, this comes directly from the proposal, uh, you have uh, basically on the shard, um, you have this set of execution uh, environment states, um, which basically we can just um, define as a list of these, um, these root hashes that are produced at each slot or block. And uh, here is an example. So we've been collaborating uh, pretty closely with um, the EWASM team. So uh, Casey and Alex, um, at, they're about to talk after me. Uh, they did a uh, scout um, is basically a prototyping around some of this work. Um, and so just to show real quick, you could have this process block function takes the pre-state root, gives out a post-state root. And um, also we've kind of begun to put together a uh, proposal on how an ETH1 execution environment may look like um, and how, how that whole system goes together. This is on ETH research. Cool. Um, so gas payments or fee environment. So um, in order to have this system where multiple execution environments can be executed under, um, without the block producer having to understand them, having to audit them, and having to make sure that they're getting paid to run each of them, um, you can consider that there could be um, an alternate uh, network uh, to manage gas fees. Um, and there could actually be an execution environment around this. And in general, what that could look like is you have this network of nodes. Um, and in this case, you transmit your transaction to them, similar to a, a mempool. Um, they're responsible for understanding and knowing the various execution environments and whether they're getting paid properly from your transaction that can be pegged to some type of value. Um, and organizing uh, a block into the most valuable transactions with the highest reward for themselves. Um, and then offering just a flat fee to the upcoming block producer. So if the block producer takes it, um, then uh, they get that fee from the relayer. Um, and then the relayer gets paid for each of the transactions. Um, so just a quick diagram. I'm a user. I put out a transaction to a network, offering a fee to a relayer. Um, relayers begin taking my transaction. And then they may package it into a block of transactions that then gets transmitted or emitted to a block producer who should theoretically take the highest fee. Um, this system is stateless. Uh, that's being at least proposed. Um, there's also the concept of maybe not making it stateless. So um, Vitalik uh, shared you know, the different, um, the, the different uh, iterations of what this could look like. Um, and you, in, in a stateless model, you may have relay networks that manage the witness data that goes with that um, or other third parties. Um, and in general, in a stateless system, uh, each transaction contains Merkle proofs for the state that it accesses. Um, so instead of having um, a database of state that's managed on the node, um, you can consider the database is provided with your transaction. Um, so I'm going to go into comparison between different systems. Uh, so Cosmos, um, I actually have uh, a lot of respect for them. They they shipped, um, they shipped, and uh, they they tend to take a uh, a um, they they have different assumptions, and again they in general take on this frame of an IoT of blockchains, um, and in general that can be one application per blockchain. Um, it doesn't have to be limited to that necessarily, depending on how you design that environment. Um, but in general, the BFT consensus that's um, set up on Tendermint, at least um, last time I read, is limited to around um, 1,000 validators. And then you can also launch a POA chain um, within the network as well. So in, in general, it just takes different, different assumptions than, um, than what we do. Uh, Polkadot, um, a different expl or an explanation here is they um, have a system where you have one galaxy or execution environment per shard, um, and shards are auctioned off. So um, in this case, uh, if, if I want to um, produce um, a shard dedicated to my application that has an execution environment that is, um, that is 
specific to that, then I have to purchase a shard um, to do that. Um, and it, it's definitely also a different assumption. It's also a different paradigm. Um, and there are risks there as well. So one risk is the centralization risk of um, one party owning a shard. Um, and even this idea of, is that the best use of resources? So um, for example, in uh, um, in ETH2 system, you have 1024 shards, which is already equating to about a six minute cycle time on the beacon chain. Um, but uh, what's, what's interesting is you kind of let the market decide how to fill up each shard. So you can have multiple execution environments on each of those shards. Um, and it uses, it uses that bandwidth a little bit more efficiently. Um, within Polkadot, you are generally um, w with the system of one um, execution environment per shard. Um, you, uh, you, the, in the long term, you would technically have a much higher uh, period of time on the beacon chain, um, since you would technically, to achieve the same thing, you'd have to have a number of um, additional shards. The other thing is, in Polkadot, there'd always be async communication between execution environments, um, since by default, they're always on a separate shard. Um, and they tend to take more of a library-based approach to this idea of like a, a, a execution environment builder. Um, that they're focused on. Um, others near Harmony um, uh, are approaching one execution framework um, across all shards. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm not going to go too deep into this because there's the session that's coming up. But uh, cross-shard transactions, uh, you can consider are basically um, the design behind them can be defined within each execution environment. Um, and so in a yanking model, you consider it as basically you burn something. Um, and print some proof of it or some type of receipt of it um, or some message, and then you can go ahead and consume that in the receiving shard and bring it into existence. Um, cross shard calls, um, we have actually um, put some of this in the ETH research post that we had and some ideas behind that um, as well. Um, but cross shard calls um, would operate a little bit different than yanking, um, where you basically just produce receipts that that will be consumed back and forth um in in uh then there's the idea of uh optimistic uh receipt routes that vitalik put a really good write-up on um that is very interesting and can reduce that to basically uh one block um, latency versus having to wait for six minutes for finality um and then something that i've been interested in personally are synchronous models specifically a lot of the uh, delayed state execution models um, I highly recommend people look into that. That's, there's a lot of conversation about that. Um, I tend to think that there's a bit of time to be able to develop those further, though. Um, so open questions that I have that I think about um, within this proposal um, are the uh, incentive attack vectors um, and vi general viability of the relay networks. Um, and so that's personally uh, what I'm diving into next. So I'll be doing some analyses on that. Um, perfect. And then uh, um, we're working on benchmarking a lot of these systems, what they could look like. Um, right now, Scout um, is already benchmarking uh, the uh, stateless approach and providing witnesses. Um, and so we've actually, Matt specifically, has been building around Scout and contributing to that effort as well. Um, talking about ETH1 to the ETH2 transition, um, we've put up an ETH research post regarding this. Um, Matt, Matt posted specifically. Um, I, there are questions on the optimistic async transaction mechanism, how that would be implemented in practice. Um, and so again, we'll talk about this in the workshop. Um, to me, uh, there are a number of, um, a number of design questions, um, specifically on how the routes from shard to shard are predicted properly. Um, and so that, that is, um, and, and also how, um, you know, it's, alternative states that are created, how that affects um, the storage as a whole of the relay networks or other third-party storage networks. Um, synchronous cross-shard transactions are super interesting. Uh, the, what the Ethereum execution environment will look like. Um, ETH2 execution environment as being a, another execution environment that the community stands behind that's more iterated. Um, and then there's even a question, do you have to, um, you know, what, how, how is that approached? Um, Scout, Iwasm, what they're working on, um, we're here to also support a lot of those efforts as well. Um, so current work, um, I won't go, I think I'm out of time. 
Um, but we actually built some early prototypes and examples um, uh, with uh, um, on, on work around phase two. Um, and um, again, just continue to build and research and prototype and benchmark these things. That's all. And right after me is Casey, who will be talking about the same thing. <laughs> cool. In, any questions? I feel like most of the questions are probably going to be really answered during the workshop, but I, yeah, happy to. Um, if you have validator, wouldn't the best strategy is to also be a relayer as well? If yes, then why the separation of concerns? You're saying if you're a block, yeah. Beating up uh, versus the persistent community rotation then it would not make sense for you to be a relayer because you would just not be able to keep track of the state of whatever shard you're relaying fast enough. Yeah, I tend to agree with that. And then also, um, uh, it, it'll be like pretty hardcore to run some of the relay networks, um, specifically because you are going to have to, like if you want to be selecting your relay block, um, you'd have to be running it on all shards. Um, and the assumption is that I don't know, an assumption could be that most people who are buying into POS aren't necessarily running all these additional massive infrastructure systems across all shards. But um, yeah. this analysis, I'll, I'll be diving into. And if we want to reduce the number of like classes of actors from three to two, the other approach is to kind of, instead of folding relayers into consensus nodes or kind of optionally fold relayers into transaction senders, because if you... Um, like especially if we go down this route of blocks being allowed to have like m many partitions, then one partition could potentially just contain one transaction. And in that case, like you as a transaction sender would just publish a kind of consensus level block segment that just contains your thing, plus including whatever the Merkle proofs are. Yeah, hmm. that makes sense. Other other cues? Yes. Did I represent Cosmos well? Enough? Okay, cool. Awesome. Uh, <laughs> um, is the reason for having one execution environment for, sh or more than one execution environment for a charge so you don't run out of possible execution environments? Like, so you're not capped at the number of execution environments? You're saying within Polkadot? No, within, but, so is, is it, like, my, my question is, why do you want multiple execution environments Because you don't know, a, uh, you don't know ahead of time, like, which execution environments are going to be the most popular. Sure. Um, so I guess my question is, it makes sense you want multiple execution environments per shard, but would you ever want the same execution environment on multiple shards? Like, oh, absolutely, that's the dominant use case. Yeah, yeah, so... The people who need to balance pretty like, soon. If you have, like, if one of these execution environments is, like, the main one that people use to, to run smart contracts, you could imagine, like, half of all activity running through it, so it would have to be available on all shards. It's just so because cool. Need to Sounds good.
It'll be a few moments. We're just waiting for them to click on the link. Yep. Yes. Hello. Oh, we won't hear them. Yes. Can you guys hear us? Yep. Yes. Do you have Can you see us? The YouTube one. Okay, we only have one way audio, so I'm just going to assume that you can hear and see us. Uh, yeah, I'm Casey. This is Alex. We're on the UASM team. Let me get the slides loaded up. I guess while Casey is loading the slides, uh, and then we are trying to uh, have some really cool diagrams and hopefully it's gonna explain how all the different phases are gonna work with execution. Um, and lastly, we're gonna look at some of a, a proposed roadmap, um, as well as gonna deep dive into Scout, uh, how to use Scout, how to get involved, um, and what Scout is. Um, do you guys see the slides? Great. Um, all right, Casey, so it's, it's you then oh. with the history. <laughs> Thanks, Alex. Yeah, I, I did propose this to the organizers as a separate talk, but they said day three was all about phase two. And I guess um, phase one and done doesn't sound like, it sounds like it's about phase one and not phase two. Uh, to better understand the subtleties around phase one and phase two, I think it's worthwhile to step back and run through some history. Uh, which, we'll just have to do that quickly. So the history of ETH2 execution and the distinction between phase one and phase two actually started with the Casper prototypes at the end of 2015 and beginning of 2016. Uh, these were the old days when Casper was consensus by bet. It would later pivot to consensus by justification, but even at consensus by bet, there was a curious feature. So Casper back then had two betting cycles, it had the flock hash betting cycle and the state root betting cycle. These two betting cycles separated two processes. Um, coming, the first process was coming to consensus on block order, and the second one was the uh, process of executing the transactions in those blocks. The realization that these two processes are fundamentally different became more and more important. Uh, so a consensus game was needed to solve the data availability problem. That was the hard one. If that's solved and you have consensus that blocks are available and they're in some given order, then transaction execution is easy by comparison because it's just a verification game. So you can use Trubit to solve it or maybe shadow chains. <laughs> I'm not sure because it's been a while since I read that blog post about shadow chains. Um, so fast forward to 2018. Right, the, the ETH2 architecture was built on this realization that we only need consensus on the order of data blobs and we don't need to worry about executing the data blobs or processing the transactions in the data blobs uh, in, the, in the consensus layer. So phase one <clears throat> is, <clears throat> is part of the consensus game and phase two where the data blobs are inspected for transactions would be a totally separate process. Um, would be a separate process. And ideally, these two phases would be totally decoupled. 
this was our understanding, or at least it was my understanding after the uh, the ECDC in, in July of 2018, the Ethereum Client Developers Conference in Berlin. And I liked this idea of a decoupled architecture. I really did. Uh, but the next memorable event was the ETH2 workshop in, in Prague, which took place in the days before DevCon, before DevCon 4. There was a spec for phase zero and there was a spec for phase one, but nobody knew how phase two would work. The, the lack of clarity around phase two hit me particularly hard because somehow I was nominated as facilitator of the phase two working group. Uh, well, Danny asked me to, I guess, and nobody else volunteered. So when I gave our working group summary to all of the workshop participants at the end of the day, and all I could say was, well, one takeaway is it seemed like seems like delayed execution might be simpler because Vitalik came over and said so in the last 10 minutes. To say that people felt un underwhelmed by progress on phase two uh, it would be an understatement. Now, entering in 2019, the situation was much the same as it was in mid-2018. All questions remained open. The design space was still huge. The possibilities were endless. We didn't know where to start. Uh, how will state rent work? Will we use immediate execution or delayed execution? Will all validators be executors or will executors be a different role? Uh, if, if, the, if phase one and phase two are decoupled, then there's, you know, executors, in theory, it should be possible to have them as, as a, a separate role, a separate node type. And then everyone's favorite question, how will cross shard calls work? All of these open questions led to a tension between the, the Iwasan team and the research team. The research, they wanted us to tell them how things would work, and we wanted them to tell us how things would work. Eventually, I lost my patience. Instead of going in circles seeking the perfect solution, uh, and I mean, it looked like getting there would take too long, let's try the straightforward approach, the simple thing that should obviously work and be done with it. And that's how phase one and done was born. So we forget about the kitchen sink full of features that would be nice to have in phase two. Forget about state rent. Uh, no cross shard frou-frou. Just say cross shard call one more time. I dare you, say it one more time. <laughs> Even at phase two, we were giving up on delivering a good, a good uh, developer experience because it would take too long. So if we want to launch, if we want to launch ASAP with you know, with terrible DevX, then let's just do it in phase one. Why wait? It's so bare bones, we can launch it this week. Um, so that's a brief history of, yeah, of phase two. And you're probably still wondering what phase one and done is. So let's see if these diagrams can help. Um, so what are we looking at here, Alex, with this? Uh, well, it's the beacon blocks and um, the, the, the actual blocks are there, with, which are the beacon blocks. And on the left, there is the beacon state, which doesn't really contain here anything. Um, to us, this is a black box. We don't really need to know anything about it. And uh, everyone in the room, I think, is much more proficient. So we're just going to skip explaining this. Yeah, part. you guys already know about the beacon chain, so um, we don't need to go there. Uh, so next, we add some shards, and notice how each shard is cross-linked into a different beacon block. This is the, you know, the cycle of of, uh, of how cross-links work. <laughs> then next, um, this is the phase one spec without execution, just uh, just data blobs. I mean. There's no execution, but it is hashing the data, right? With SHA-256 is hashing kind of an execution. I mean, it is kind of execution. You're executing the same function over and over, the SHA-256 function, uh, which is kind of boring. So what's next? So here in phase one shards with minimal execution, Instead of executing SHA-256 on every block, we're executing some WASM code on every block. It's really not that different. It's just that the execution engine runs WASM code instead of running the SHA-256 function every time. 
So, so this wasm code, which layer is that on? Um, which layer is the wasm code on? Let's see, the next slide. Well, look, if wasm code is code that users deploy, then it's not at layer one, is it? It's at some other number higher than one. It's not really clear what people should call it, but it is clear that this wasm code is not at the consensus layer. Um, the, it, this means that phase two upgrades, that is upgrades to Ethereum execution environments, they can occur with no hard forks of E2. Of, of e so this makes phase two quite different from phase zero and one, which, you know, if you want to add execution to shards, then you're going to need a hard fork. But if you want to add more execution environments, or if you want to upgrade execution environments, you don't need a hard fork. Um, so the details of execution environments are still being explored. Nobody knows exactly what the EE landscape is going to look like. Um, by the way, I think of EEs as just contracts on ETH2. Uh, this is kind of confusing because um, if we call them contracts, then when referring to ETH1 contracts inside the ETH1 EE, we'd have to say the contract within the contract, which would be even more confusing. So people want to call them EEs rather than contracts. Um, another buzzword you'll hear is relayers. Um, well, before we go to relayers, what, what is the, because you mentioned each one EE, what, but what is Bob's, what, what is that thing? Oh, Bob's EE? Well, that's just Bob. I mean, he decided to deploy his EE on the same shard as the ETH1 EE. I mean, so now sometimes ETH1 blocks have to wait for Bob's blocks because anybody can deploy EEs to any shard, right? So we can't stop him. Well, I'm still confused about Bob, but how the hell does he submit these blocks? Is he like doing it by hand? I mean, Bob, he can do it by hand. He might have a relayer. It's, Bob is free to do whatever he wants. Bob is a hacker. OK. Well, I'm sure Bob's going to figure out a, a really good relayer design. Um, and practically, that's like one of the really exciting open topics. Um, because they are like the bridge, which can provide a really good developer experience. Um, while we can keep everything on the beacon chain and the shards, we're really simple. So I guess, I guess that's our goal. And maybe it is the point we can stop looking at the, these really cool slides uh, and diagrams. And maybe it's time to move over to the roadmap um, to see how we can actually get there. So we have four items on the roadmap, and I'm going to go into more detail with them. <clears throat> um, the first one is we need to finalize phase one execution. Um, because as Casey mentioned, that is needed uh, to, in order to launch. And if you want to change phase one execution, that would be a protocol update slash hard fork on E2. And we want to avoid those. Um, so in order to finalize phase one execution, we need to agree on a couple of things. Um, it's the most important one is the execution environment interface. Um, but we also need to figure out and agree on how to do uh, ether transfers, how to do in shard calls, how to do cross shard calls. Um, I think these four are the main items today. Um, I have two more listed here. They're not a requirement in order to finalize phase one. But if we start considering them today, we might find some issues or learnings which can also advise our design for phase one. Now, once we have phase one finalized, semi-finalized, uh, we definitely have to shift our focus on experimenting with EEs. But this doesn't mean that experimenting with EEs uh, should, should not start before we finalize phase one. This will start at the same time, and in fact, it already has started. Um, but once we have phase one done, then the only thing we have to focus on is the EEs. And on the execution environments, I've listed a couple of examples here. And they are kind of like in order of uh, the order we are developing them. This E1 block validator is not really useful, uh, but it gives us a way to benchmark uh, the speed of executing an E1 block, aka an EVM block. Um, some other ideas are here to, to do uh, Stark, Snarks verification. We definitely have to focus a lot on um, different witness encodings and which ones are the, the best 
uh, for doing ETHON execution uh, or any kind of other EE. Um, the only working fitness encoding today uh, in the examples is using SSZ partial Merkle trees, but I expect there will be other experiments with different uh, witness formats. And obviously we're gonna have pure MEEs with, with and without chart communication, a lot of other experiments. Now, the really big EE we definitely have to focus on is, which has been mentioned a couple of times already uh, by Will as well, is this uh, execution environment, which is similar to each one. Now, what I mean by this is, it's gonna have a state, it's gonna behave like each one, and likely the development is gonna start with taking each one as it is. Uh, but I think we may need to iterate on, on some improvements on this design, maybe uh, improve something on the, on the tree, maybe improve something on the accounts. Um, but eventually, I think we're gonna arrive at a really good design, uh, which has a really good performance on E2. And this is the point where we can figure out are there any changes needed for E1 in order to be test for performant on E2? And if there are any changes needed for E1, we need to deploy that as a, as a hard fork on E1. Um, and after that, hard fork has been launched on E1, we are ready to move on to the E1 switch over, which is the final milestone. Um, the goal there is to seamlessly integrate E1 with E2. And uh, that's basically the result of the uh, milestone tree experimentation. It's going to be the hopefully the last ETH1 protocol update, uh, moving the entire state into a shard. Uh, Vitalik has mentioned how it's going to work is uh, on his like five uh, option scale. And I don't think we mean here that we would move the entire data uh, of ETH1 into a shard. Rather, we heavily focus on using three layers uh, to take control of that data. Uh, and we keep the shard as minimal as possible. So that's like briefly the four milestones we have in mind today. Obviously this could change, um, um, but I think it's a good good milestone list to start with. All right, so move on, moving on to the practical progress, what actually exists today? And I think this was the title of the presentation initially. Um, this is about Iwasam Scout. Uh, which Will has mentioned a few times in his talk. Um, so what is Scout? Uh, we have announced Scout probably two weeks ago. Um, the GitHub link is, uh, is Scout itself. It's a monorepo. It has a couple of things inside. I'm going to explain those. Uh, but there's also a longer each research post, which explains the, the goals, uh, some of the design decisions we had made two weeks ago, which, which of course are subject to change. And it also spawned a conversation between uh, Matt, uh, Vitalik, and myself. So I think it's definitely worth checking it out. Um, so Scout itself is a uh, execution engine for E2. It is based on Vitalik's proposal too, uh, but of course it can have some changes and, and already have some uh, deviations to that. It black boxes everything from phase zero and phase one uh, up until the tiny amount of features we need uh, for Scout. Um, so Scout itself um, defines an API for these execution environments. And let's just call this API the EEI. Um, and the EEI is a term coming from eWASM, uh, where it meant Ethereum environment interface, basically the set of methods a contract can use to interact with the state. Um, and I think the naming still applies here, although we could also consider naming, um, uh, naming it as the execution environment interface. Uh, but basically the EEI is a set of functions uh, these E2 contracts slash EEs uh, can use. Uh, so Scout is defining these. Scout is also defining a test format and gives a tool which can execute on that format. Um, it is a mono repo, so it has a lot of, well, only two examples right now, but a lot of other examples are coming. Um, so it has example EEs. And one of the main goals of it is to support benchmarking uh, of these different E's, um, because the goal is to figure out the best design, uh, the most performant design, and benchmarking is a key element in that, uh, that process. So Scout itself is written in Rust. It's only 400 lines of code. It's very simple. And anyone who wants to work on E's uh, doesn't need to understand Scout or Rust at all. 
Uh, it is just there. It works. Uh, it uses uh, WASM, which is a WASM interpreter. Uh, but the code is designed to be flexible to support other engines or even multiple engines, um, um, especially in order to benchmark them. The test format itself is YAML, and I'm going to show some examples later on. The execution environments are, of course, WASM bytecodes. And we kind of expect that when, uh, so basically, Scout should help us drive the conversation and design decisions on the phase one uh, execution environment spec. And hopefully, it's going to implement the final one as we go ahead. And basically, I don't expect that there's going to be more than a 1,000 lines. Um, and the goal is that those are the 1,000 lines, each of the E2 clients. Oh, there's a typo there. So each one of the E2 clients uh, would need to integrate is like this four or 1,000 lines of code. And they would be ready to execute uh, everything we have shown so far. Um, now, a bit more on this execution uh, environment interface, the EI stuff. Um, so Casey mentioned that basically the execution of our environments are like contracts. Um, by accounts, I kind of meant the same. Um, and basically, the reason I mentioned it uh, is this slide is showing what are the inputs to the actual execution and what is the output. So the input itself is the data blob, which is part of the shard block. And in, in the execution environment account, in the shard state, uh, we have a pre-state root. And this is the input. And then the output, we're going to return a modified, a new state root. And optionally, we can return a list of uh, deposit receipts to, to move uh, each other around. Now, this is just here for completeness. It shows the actual WASM API. E2 is a namespace in WASM. Uh, and, and the stuff after the two columns is the, the function name. Um, so basically, this matches the, the previous slide. We have this load pre-state root, uh, which loads it into memory. Uh, these two for block data are uh, the way to get the, the, the block blob. Um, and then the, the saving of the state root and the deposits. Now to have a brief look at what kind of EEs we have right now. So in Scout, in the, the repo, the two, the two only which are merged in uh, is a Hello World and a Bazaar. And both of these are going to have their own slides. But we have had, in the past week or so, a lot of people working on, on different execution environments to get them familiarized with it. And let, I listed here a couple of them. Um, the assembly script one is really interesting because it shows that uh, even though Scout, the example ones, are heavily using Rust, but there's no need to use Rust to write execution environments. It can be written in any language which compiles to, to WASM. Uh, of course, today the two mature languages are uh, Rust and C, um, but there are up and coming languages which also uh, can be compiled to WASM. Uh, we also have a, uh, another example which does Snarks verification. We have BLS signature verification, uh, a token contract in C, and there are two bigger efforts to, to work on this ETH1 environment as uh, in an EE. Um, now, this is the hello world. I just wanted to show uh, what it looks like in Rust. So the only important part here is we're loading the, the pre-state root, which is this 32 byte hash. And we ensure that there was no data sent. And because there was no data sent, there was no change made to the state. So we just saved the same state we started with. So that's the hello world, and that's implemented in Rust and assembly script. Now, the bazaar is a bit more complicated but because it, uh, it maintains a state. Uh, but of course, we don't really have, in the beacon state, we don't really have a place to put uh, this state. Um, so therefore, the, there must be a witness uh, of the state we're modifying. This witness has to be submitted as part of the blob, the as part of the block. And here, these three um, object descriptions uh, are following the SSZ notation from the E2 specs. Uh, the input block is, is, of course, the incoming block. It has the, uh, the pre-state, and it has the new messages we're applying to the state. Um, I don't want to go much deeper, but whoever has seen the SSZ specifications in E2, this should be pretty self-explanatory. Uh, so the bazaar would be a good place to start working on EEs. Uh, so briefly on the test format, um, it has three parts. Uh, the beacon state, 
stores the codes, uh, but we're operating on shards. Um, so in the shard, we have, of course, the, the pre-state, the post-state, and we can have any number of shard blocks. Um, I don't want to go much deeper in, in here, but here's a much more complex example, which actually uses uh, three, uh, three different blocks and uses two different execution environments. So all of this is working. Uh, and basically in Scout, the, there are two things someone needs to do in order to use Scout. They need to write this YAML file and they need to create a WASM bytecode, which is execution environment. Uh, Scout takes this YAML file, executes it, gives you the result, that's it. So the next steps on Scout, we, we have to add uh, new examples and we want to add a framework which uh, would enable one to write in the same code base, uh, from the same code base, generate an execution environment bytecode as well as generate a relayer. Uh, and of course, initially this relayer stuff would be just a CLI tool which generates these test cases, but eventually of course they could grow into actual useful relayers. Um, we, want to, we want to support multiple Watson engines. We want to make the interface much more friendly. And we also want to display benchmarking results on GitHub. And this is the exciting part. Um, I guess this is the time to get involved and be an EE wizard. Um, so the only thing you need to do is create this execution environment, write a test case, submit a PR, uh, scout will benchmark these and we'll tell you the result. And once you did that, you can also join our secret EE discussion channel, the Viz Club. Thank you guys for listening. If we do have a minute or two for questions, we're happy to answer any of them. So we nervously look at Telegram if there's any questions coming in because we have no audio from the room. No questions. All right, talk to you on, on Gitter then. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Um, thanks all for coming. Um, we have a couple things. We're looking for people to work with us. Um, Part-time, or, oh, Plasma Group, Plasma Group. Um, I'm, I represent Plasma Group. We're looking for full-time, short-term contractors to help us build Predicates. Um, so hit me up. I'm Jingle Jam on Telegram. Um, next up, can we have... Uma, and then after Uma, chain link. <laughs> so all I want to say, guys, is first of all, start by thanking our spectacular organizers, which includes Jing leaving the room, Eva and Makara. Like, really pretty spectacular. This is our first time being at something like this. And while I realize it's the first scaling ETH, I think it's actually a pretty incredible event. Um, I've been talking so much, I'm losing my voice, so apologies. Um, <laughs> um, and then just to show ourselves for a second. So UMA stands for Universal Market Access. What we're really interested in is building this uh, decentralized um, financial contracts platform. And the two things that we are really um, have fun talking about and that we've learned a lot in the last couple of days are, first of all, synthetic derivatives on different layer two scaling technologies. 
Um, and this is something we love talking about, and we've had a super fun time collaborating with both the State Channel folks, um, as well as uh, Plasma Group folks and all, all the Plasma folks and Dan Robinson and Rainbow Networks. And I think we got somewhere. So I think that there were some learnings um, from all of us on how we can actually build synthetic derivatives efficiently um, and securely on layer two uh, technologies. Um, the other thing that we really wanted to kind of lob out there um, into this community is this idea of putting economic guarantees around blockchain oracles. And this is really specific to um, financial applications uh, financial contracts on blockchain um, where in our example if you can't guarantee how much um, it costs to corrupt an oracle there are failure modes where um, you can have economic incentives to bribe oracle systems so we love that concept out there um, and i think we've gotten generally pretty good feedback and learned a lot um, and it's been very helpful and that's something we're going to get a lot more public about and be publishing and writing more about and we'd love continued feedback and continued skepticism um, from the people in this room and elsewhere. Um, and lastly, it's also been great to collaborate with Chainlink um, and that team and the other um, Oracle folks that we've got to talk with. So thank you. Uh, yep. Hi, everyone. I don't think I actually need to speak in this thing. Um, yeah, first of all, I mean, thank you very much to the organizers for creating such a nice setting for us to have all these interesting conversations and for bringing all these smart people together. I know from my own experience that's not uh, easy to do, and it's a lot of work, and we all you know, benefit from it, so thank you very much. Generally, uh, generally speaking, yeah, I'm from Chainlink. We are seeking to make uh, general purpose, highly secure, and easily usable Oracle mechanism to expand what Ethereum smart contracts can do so that they can go, you know, it increases what type of, of tokens can get built and it, incre it increases the existence of many other use cases. Insurance, uh, various DeFi products, all those things. Uh, we think it's pretty important because it's gonna create a whole new collection of use cases while expanding the existing ones. Uh, it's kind of, you know, this vision of smart contracts that are able to meaningfully interact with the world is kind of why we got into the space years ago and we'd really love to see it realized and uh, yeah so we're basically looking for for great people to work with we're a very excited kind of welcoming group it's uh, we're very open source focused we function on the basis of uh, idea meritocracy so you know the best ideas in our in our environment usually went out uh, the people that we're really looking to work with right now like the, the set of problems we have right now that correlate to the people we want to work with, uh, basically senior software engineering folks, senior product management folks. So we're starting uh, to, to have so many things that, um, not so many things, but things that need to be built at a certain level of quality that we have you know, a need for senior product management. Uh, we are always looking for good security folks. So for auditing on a part-time basis, uh, any kind of you know regular part-time interaction where you give us feedback on the security model we have, the security of our off-chain code, security of on-chain code. We're always very interested in working with good people that you know know how secure systems are built. We take that very seriously. And then the last thing is crypto economic research. So we um, we're starting a fellowship program and we're you know, planning to begin a fellowship and a grants program, working at a few different universities. But we're also hiring people uh, that are, you know, finishing a graduate program or want to do things part time as a postdoc. And uh, we're also working with many professors. So basically, if you have an interest in how economic systems interact with blockchain based incentives, we, um, you know, we have a production working system where your theories can be tested out or at the very least you can contribute to a set of theories that are getting tested out on production. So, yeah, well, yeah, thank you. Thank you. And it's been great to collaborate with everyone, Uma Group, everybody. It's nice, nice to meet you all and see everybody again. Yo, is Kartik here? What? Kartik. Yeah. He's got it. Oh. Okay. Um, everyone, I, I just wanted to say, um, you know, Paradigm, we're really, happy, we're really happy to have been invited here and we're really grateful to Jing and Eva and Mika for having a, run a really fantastic event. Um, we love participating in stuff like this and it's great for the ecosystem. If you have a project that you're interested in 
getting money for. Um, we, have, we have money. Um, and uh, if you are a developer who's interested in working on anything and has any particular skills, um, we have a lot of portfolio companies that uh, love to hire uh, talented developers. So please come talk to us as well about that. Thanks, Aaron. Hey everybody, I'm uh, Kartik. Uh, I work at a fund called A Capital, and uh, we are uh, strong believers in this space, and we kind of support initiatives like Youth Global and a handful of other events. Um, we're proud to kind of, it's an amazing event so far. Um, I just want to make sure that uh, we can kind of just be helpful to uh, companies and projects in this space, um, and anywhere from kind of getting funding for research to investments in projects, and generally, if you're a developer, uh, uh, being able to work at a portfolio company or other projects in this space, we're happy to sort of be helpful with that. And with that, like, feel free to talk to me after this event. I'm here uh, for the whole day. Thanks. Hey, everyone. Um, first off, yeah, thanks uh, for scaling Ethereum. It's pretty great. Um, I'm with uh, Uniswap. We are a, a decentralized exchange protocol built on Ethereum. Uh, we are here to kind of look at um, improving execution rates, uh, front-running resistance, um, all sorts of good things. Uh, we are basically looking for developers. We recently raised a seed round. I can vouch for what Dan said about them having money and giving it out. <laughs> um, so yeah, we're, we're hiring uh, full-time developers, um, ideally in New York, but you know, potentially remote. Uh, we're looking for people who know things like math and cryptography and smart contracts and Web3 and JavaScript and all that good stuff. So, uh, you know, send me an email, Hayden at Uniswap.io. Yeah.
There's a keyboard. Under you, it pulls out. Hey guys, um, my name is Daniel and I work with WhiteBlock um, and today we j I want to talk to you about uh, some of the tests that we've been running regarding the P2P's gossip sub library and uh, talk to you about some of the results we got. Uh, so for the, oh, the motivations for these tests is one, it's never been tested before so we got to check it out. Um, potential use usage in other blockchain projects. And a lot of these projects are hinging on the fact that libp2p actually works and uh, they're performant, but we, we won't know until we actually test them. And uh, another point of, or another motivation is to, is because it's potential usage in E2. Um, so for gossip sub, it can potentially uh, pose a lot of significant bottlenecks that we, we might not be aware of. And we want to make sure that we can foresee all of those things before we actually set them in stone. And for E2, also um, timing is crucial. We want to make sure that the message handling that gossip sub, um, what gossip sub is will be responsible for is going to be um, within a certain time that we want to say, hey, like, it's gonna, these messages will pass or they will, will fail because um, messages or E2 is highly reliant on time because of the way that the uh, beacon blocks will be proposed. Um, so for our methodology, you can find all of this, our testing library and everything in our repo, but what we do is we set up, um, we use libp2p's Golang gossip sub daemon implementation for this test. Uh, we, we create a client daemon pair, we pair them statically, uh, send messages via RPC to propagate through gossip sub, um, parse the logs, gather data, analyze that data, and then um, we use something called a threshold for failure time, um, and we set it to be three seconds. So the reason why we do this is because um, there's supposed to be like a certain time frame that messages needed, needs to be relayed, and then have those messages deconstructed, have application logic done to them, then um, sent out again for the majority of nodes to acknowledge. And that should be done within three seconds and received within three seconds. So this three second kind of um, is just a one way um, message time and the round trip would be six seconds. But that's kind of like the logic why we chose three seconds to be uh, the threshold time for failure. Um, here's the spe uh, system specs for how we've done te the tests. Um, and if you guys miss any numbers or tables, graphs, then it's fine. We're going to um, post a Medium uh, article with all of this stuff. So, yeah. Um, and this is how we've uh, run our test, like our procedure. We build the network, uh, provision the nodes, configure network conditions if applicable, um, configure actions, kind of like uh, which one sends messages and stuff like that. Um, log outputs. Um, we we aggregate, and then the raw data is parsed, um, that is pushed to appropriate repo, and then the environment is reset so that we can um, run, a, run the next test. Uh, so here are the test cases that we run. Um, one, the series one is a control where we have all the variables set. Um, we want to make sure that we have like a baseline so that we can see um, what the differences are when we change a certain variable. Uh, the second test is for message size, their sending number of sending nodes, uh, bandwidth, 
network latency, packet loss, and then a stress test, which is a combination of bandwidth, network latency, and packet loss, because uh, in the real world, we're not just going to have one network impairment, but a combination of them. Uh, so yeah, this is kind of just a breakdown of these test cases. Um, we have 100 nodes. 50 of them are sending. Um, each node is peered with 10 other nodes. Uh, the message size is 200 bytes. Bandwidth is uh, 1 gig. No network latency packet loss. That would describe our control. And then for our message size, we change it from 200 to 500, and then 25 megabytes, and then 500 megabytes, or uh, kilobytes, sorry. Uh, 500 bytes, 25 kilobytes, 500 kilobytes. And then we uh, change the number of sending nodes, uh, 10, 40, 90. Uh, bandwidth test, we have 50 megs, 20, 250 megs, and 750 megs. Um, network latency, we add 10 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds, 500 milliseconds. For packet loss, we add 0.01%, 0.1%, and 1% packet loss. And this is for the combination, uh, the stress test, where we have 10 megabytes of bandwidth, 150 milliseconds of latency, and 0.1% of packet loss. And this is kind of just to emulate more realistic adversarial network conditions. And here are the results uh, kind of graphed. Um, I had said earlier for the three seconds we determine as um, a message failure, but I've also added an, a graph for six seconds because um, a beacon block is proposed every six seconds. So if a message fails to be received within a six second time frame, then it would be a considered like a definite fail. So that's why I have them separated, uh, just to show based off of our definition and just kind of like objectively when it would fail. Uh, from here, we see that um, series two has the most, it's significantly <laughs> most uh, failure rates. Uh, this is all in percentage, by the way. So um, it's kind of like the percentage of messages that are, um, that haven't reached haven't been propagated um, in under three seconds and in this one uh, in under six, six seconds. So we have the most degradation in pre performance um, in series two, which is for mes message size. The last test for series three, which is uh, for the number of sending nodes. And then um, for the stress test. Um, and then I'm gonna go a little deeper or here's the tables of all of the percentages. Uh, that I put it into graphs, but yeah. Um, from here, we can see that 2B has a pretty significant um, failure percentage. Um, for it, for the threshold for three seconds, we see um, over 94% um, failure, and then for over six seconds, over 90 to 95%. But um, Yeah, and same here uh, for the stress test for the threshold for three seconds, we see about a 40% a failure rate. And yeah, um, just to go here. Um, so we see significant degradation in the performance when um, the network is introduced to a larger message size, um, high number of sending nodes, uh, which, could, which could correspond to uh, the clogging of the network um, and high network latency. But uh, we see resilience in the pres uh, presence of bandwidth and packet loss. Um, for message size, uh, this is pretty important because um, when we, as you guys saw in the uh, tables, uh, uh, for a message size of 25 kilobytes, we saw a failure rate of about 94%. And in ETH2, we, we're gonna, it's proposed to have the message size be around 23 kilobytes and a maximum size of 98 with, at 300K validators. But um, if that's the, w from our current test that we've ran and the proposed block size of 23 kilobytes, it's, it doesn't look so hot, <laughs> but um, yeah, something that we could probably 
or we need to discuss is um, what the message size is actually going to be for ETH2 and um, do additional testing to see uh, what the failure rate is at that um, message size. Uh, for message senders, um, we see uh, performance degradation when we have an increased number of sending nodes. Um, so in our test, we have the network comprised of 100 nodes. And um, in the Series C test, we have 90 of those nodes sending messages. And we see around a 46% failure rate. And this um, brings up the question of how many, so like what happens when the network is DOSed? Um, when all of the all of the nodes in the network are like spamming messages, um, and there's not enough message relayers, then there might uh, be a problem, and might this might need to discuss um, if we need like kind of like a certain a ratio of message propagators to message senders. Um, for the stress test, this is. Um, this will probably be the most indicative um, in the in with regards to network conditions, uh, and uh, this will we saw around a forty percent um, failure rate, and yeah, um, we also part of our analysis we also use call grind, um, which is an application to uh, measure the number of times and. Uh, the amount of time a, a software had taken uh, calling a library or function and then which was kind of weird uh, we saw like a significant amount of time um, in in the libp2p library uh, compiling regex and this is just kind of like a snippet of what what we've observed multiple phases that we want to do these testing testing initiatives, and we want we would like to make this a collaborative effort. We want to talk to more E2 implementers, uh, the community, um, protocol labs, and we actually gotten feedback from them, and we plan to coordinate further tests um, with their help. And some of the things that they've uh, suggested was, um, or what they've expressed to us was, the Gossip sub library is still in its experimental stages, so. Uh, there's still a lot of development that's necessary um, and then uh, some of the things that they've uh, suggested in our our test is um, for example using a different uh, crypto library instead of the go standard library um, more specifically ed25519 keys and um, during the time that we ran these tests they actually came out with a more updated version so in our future tests, we're going to use their um, up most up-to-date uh, code. And yeah, uh, so for additional tests, we want to validate that our findings are right and also find future correlations regarding incremental latency, packet loss, um, bandwidth, width, uh, message sizes, and calculate the linear regression of those. Um, increase, decrease peer counts, um, intermittent dropping of nodes, and um, supply the nodes with additional resources and see if um, this library is resource exhaust exhaustive or not. And for collaboration, um, we want to... Okay. Collaboration, uh, yeah, so I'd love to take the time later on um, to discuss what this um, threshold for failure is because just because I say it's or we say it's three seconds doesn't mean it actually is and um, yeah uh, and also kind of like what the minimum percentage of successful message propagation would be in order for us to have confidence in us integrating uh, gossip sub into E2 and um, you know, this might have effects on consensus or how the network behaves, but um, yeah, so I think we have to come to a point where we're going to be confident using this um, library. And the way to do that would be to <laughs> continue testing, um, talk about what additional parameters that we need to test, 
and also we highly um, we we want you guys to do testing on your own so that you guys can vet our code you guys can validate our findings and uh, we have all of our stuff is open source so if you just go to like you can use our tooling to run these tests and yeah, uh, we just want to be as collaborative as possible, um, discuss all of these things with you guys and be on the same page. And yeah, uh, here are some useful links. Um, that's our test library. Uh, Genesis is our tooling that you guys can use to uh, provision and deploy nodes and run these tests. And yeah, um, if you guys have any questions, yeah. <laughs> um, with the failure rates, uh, is that is it failure class as when a message does not is not transmitted to all nodes on the network? Um, no, it's failure? it's when a message has received a message, or the time difference of when uh, the message was sent and the message was received. And if that was past three seconds, or or six seconds, um, it so would be across, considered failing. So across all nodes, though. So say like I send a message and it receives like. 99% of nodes in one second and 1% of them in 12 seconds. Is that a failure? Oh, well, 1% of the messages would be considered failing, right? In that case. Okay, sure. Yeah. Right. So if we go back to here. So this is saying um, these percentage of messages have been received in over six seconds. Okay. I'm yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Sounds to me like you think the problems are more in the implementation of the library than the, the protocol design itself, is that correct? Uh, that could be highly possible. That's why we use call grind to make sure and uh, see what what the library actually calls and um, this the inefficiencies, inefficiencies there. But yeah, we, we need to do continued testing to um, make sure and pinpoint what actual parts are causing these degradations in performance. Yes? No, so uh, Plumtree, we're still working on integrating. Um, we're working with Anton to get that up. Uh, regarding um, FloodSub, with the resources allocated, um, we used pretty much the biggest box that we could um, to run these tests, but we couldn't get FloodSub to run. And that was very, very ex uh, resource exhaustive. And we just kind of um, we got like maybe 25% in. But because we couldn't get the full set of data, um, the boxes kept crashing, the nodes kept crashing. So we decided to just roll with Gauss's up for now. But we do plan on um, running those tests in the future. Yes? Can you describe the, the topology of your network? Is it like, on average, like how many hops to get to the edge of the network? Uh, so for um, the way that we have peering set up, we have, um, so for every node that's uh, instantiated, we have it, um, with the exception of the first node, uh, we have it peer with um, a node that had been created prior. And then it just continues to peer with um, the nodes that have been created. And this is done on kind of like a pseudo random basis. So it kind of creates like this um, mesh tree like st structure. So it's pretty distributed? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yes. What, what was like, did I see that your network latency was zero millisecond? Um, that's for the control. Okay. Uh, but yeah, are, are you talking about this one or? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so I mean, for these tests, when we see those, those results, that's assuming that, you know, it's like a perfect network kind of thing. Because like, in, the, in the real world, right, if you're going from Japan to Toronto, right, it might not, not be. Right? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So for series one control, it would be pretty much like running all the nodes on a, on a local machine. But then something like the stress test, that's where you would send it to an actual person. Yes. When you were saying the values with high send accounts, is a sender someone that's like adding like a new message from their application to the network? Or is that someone who's forwarding around lots of things? Uh, they're sending new messages to the network, message? yeah. Okay. Where are these nodes instantiated? Like, is this an you know, EC2 or is this like, you know, random computers that you're... Oh, um, 
we deploy this on the cloud. So they're um, essentially they're containers that are uh, sep logically and um, logically separated, and they're connected using. Um, Slipping my mind, but um, yeah, we have networking in place that um, lets them communicate. Are they all in like one infrastructure as a service uh, company, or is it like different? Oh no, it's all in one infrastructure. Yeah. Yes. Uh, what transport do you use for this? Uh, we use TCP. And will we be using testing with different transports, or? Uh, we could discuss that, but um, yeah, uh, we would love to. Yeah, talk about what other w modes of um, transportation to test. Yeah. When you were saying the high failures of the 25 kilobyte blocks, do you have any idea about what those failures were caused by? Was it like network saturation, or is it is it the client spending so much time trying to deal with the network? Or? Uh, I think it's the time. Um, so we got feedback from Protocol Labs, and it said uh, the way that they described it was how the message is being validated and verified. Okay. So I think the time to deconstruct the message and then verify that it actually is, um, it's uh, to validate it and then propagate it again, like wrap it up and send it back. This is the cryptography stuff you were mentioning. Yeah. Yes. So the, the default settings for gossip sum are that the sender signs their message and the receiver will uh, verify that it was signed by that same or received from the same person uh Do we you disable that or yeah we don't sign at all we okay. just send the message straight up yeah because that was take, for us it was taking a lot of time it was like it would have been really bad if you oh really for signing yeah oh, okay yes just to be clear are you using your own like dht or is this the big ipfs like oh uh, no own? we statically peer you so statically peer yeah over. We don't use any DHT. No DHT. Yeah. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Do you have um, other number of peers to compare? Uh, number of peers? Yeah. Uh, so that's part of our future test. We'll change um, the number of peering, number of peers per node, and see what the degradation is for that. Yeah. OK, thanks, guys. the mouse for the keys. The keys. Yeah. Okay. Do I need to speak in the microphone or? Yeah. It's pretty good, so I'm gonna have to speak to you. Okay. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. So today I'm gonna talk about roll up cross shared transactions as well as cross chain transfers um, because the two kind of go together pretty well. Uh, Uh, yeah. Okay, so. Sorry, just give me one second. Okay, so so today and yesterday, people were talking a lot about rollup. So so yesterday, Alex talked about rollup, and he talked about how we can use it for like layer two scaling. And today, um, we talked about rollup as being an execution environment, and we can use it for. We can, yeah, so we, we can just use the, the shared data. Yeah, and that's what I'm going to talk about here. So, so the problem statement is that we have, uh, we have multiple tokens and we have multiple shards and we, or this slide said chain. We have multiple chains or shards or whatever, and we want to transfer them between the both. Yeah, so in the, from what I understand about how, uh, ease 2 works is that you, you if you want to do this what you do is you have this kind of cross link right where you sort of burn some money on one chain and then you wait for six minutes and you can do something called a cross link and on the new chain you prove that you've burned the money on the other chain and you can kind of resurrect the money there yeah and you can do this kind of transfer between shards 
So this happens. So the crossings happen every six minutes, and this is kind of it's a little bit slow. And another problem is that we need to validate the crosslink for every transaction that you withdraw in the new chain. So it's not really so. There's like there's like a, a limit in the amount of cross yard transactions that you can do, uh, because there's this like fixed cost in EVM that you have to pay for, per transaction. So it would be a good idea to kind of minimize this fixed cost, and that's something that we can do with Rollo. Um, yeah. Okay. Huh. Okay. So, so I've already explained the first one. This kind of slow transfer where you burn the money, uh, you prove you burn the money on the other chain, and then you kind of resurrect it on the new chain, uh, and that works. And then there's this like improvement to this. Okay. So this will take about. So option one will take like take about six minutes to to work all together, right? Because you burn the money, then you have to wait for a cross link, and then you can resurrect the money on the other side. So this is a little bit slow, so you can do this kind of optimistic transfer where, where you burn the money on one chain, then you prove to someone that you've burned it on, uh, on one chain and they can kind of front your withdrawal. They'll say, okay, I'll give you the money for this withdrawal on chain two, and then in exchange I get your withdrawal whenever it comes through. Yeah, and I get a little something, some kind of percent or something in order to facilitate this. So this is a way that we can speed it up. It's like optimistic cross-chain transfers, right? Okay, so now, okay, so I've talked about crossing transfers, and now let me talk quickly about rollup, and then we'll kind of put the two together. Okay, so rollup uses ZK Snacks in order to, to make sure that a state transition is valid. So what we do is, we have this, this is like the data structure that we control with the snark. Okay, so inside this data structure, we have all these leaves. So Alice and Deborah here are like two people who are part of this tree. And Alice and Deborah, are, are, their balance is defined by what's underneath here, which is like their public key the balance, the nonce, and the token that they hold, right? And the idea is that we pass this to a snark, and inside the snark we, we maintain custody of the root. We just transition the root one piece at a time, updating one leaf at a time until we get to the very end, and then we have this, we pass this back to the smart contract, right? So what the snark does is it makes sure that the root is correct all the way along, and then we don't need to check anything else. Uh, and then we have to do some stuff for data availability, but that's not really uh, crucial for understanding the rest of what we're going to talk about. Cool. Yeah, and, and the other thing is data availability, but we don't really have to talk about that. Okay, so let's do the like the naive thing and say that. Oh no, this is yeah. Let's do this. Let's say that. Okay, we have roll up on two chains, so we have the root on two chains, and we validate snacks on two chains, but on each chain we kind of split. Yeah, we say on the left hand side here is shared one and only shared one is able to deposit into this part of the tree. Yeah, and to yeah, so only only shared one only shared zero is able to create leaves here in the red part. And we say the same thing about shared one. Yeah, we say that, OK, this half is for shared zero and, and shared one is here and only shared one is able to deposit into this side. Right. So now we have this kind of two roll ups that happen in parallel. Yeah, so. What we can do is that we can we can assign a single operator and each time we do a state transition we validate that transition on both chains right so we have yeah so you can see here we have shared one shared two we have state zero all the way to state oh that should be state one and state two um and anyway we have yeah so basically what we do is every time we have a transition we put a snark on both chains the snark is exactly the same and it does a state transition on both chains. So basically what we're doing is we, we do deposits on both chains, right? We deposit money on, on, on both chains and then we, we kind of merge it together inside the snack. And we have this rule that everything has to be the same. Yeah, you have to do the same state transitions on both chains. Okay, so then what happens is that we, we do this and everyone is transferring. And then uh, we have this after a certain amount of time, we do a cross link. Yeah, and we link the two together and we say, okay, now state one and state one have to equal, yeah? We just do a single lookup and we validate that everything is correct. Okay, we just we look just look up one state I, 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 on both chains, yeah? So, okay, so this works, but what happens if we enter two different states? What happens if the operator is malicious and they, they kind of change the state root between two sides, right? So, so this is what happens here, okay? Yeah. So if we don't match, we just use a fork choice rule. Okay, and we can kind of decide what our fork choice rule is later, but let's just create a naive one for now and say that we just have a single chain that's like the, 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 the single source of truth, 
Yeah, and we say that this chain is the one that we're going to believe if, if data becomes unavailable. Oh no, this is the one we're going to believe if there's, if there's like a divergence, if there's a fork. Yeah, so if that happens, what we do is we check and it's not equal. So we just make it equal, right? We just, we just edit this so that it equals this. Yeah, cool. Yeah, cool. Uh, okay, so how does this, so how do the deposits and things like that work? Okay, so basically what we do is we can deposit optimistically. Um, yeah, we can deposit optimistically and if there's a fork, we can just undo the deposits and, and have, their, have the deposits waiting in the queue. However, we have to wait for the withdrawals, right? Because the idea is that on chain one, the operator could deposit a lot of money and, and on chain two, they could withdraw it and then they can revert back to what's on chain one. Yeah, they can do this kind of attack. So, sorry, let me explain that again. So the idea is that on shared, shared one, someone deposits into the tree or the, the operator deposits into the tree. And then what they do is they, they fork the state, right? And they fork the state, so on shared two, they withdraw their money, right? And then what happens is, because this is the, the state is forked, they know that the state is going to revert to what's on chain one, yeah? So they've withdrawn their money on, on shared two, and they get to have their money again returned to them, yeah? So we have to wait for this crosslink to validate that the withdrawals are done correctly, yeah? Yeah, okay, so let me talk a little bit more about this. So, okay, then the, the final idea, okay, so, so, so it's good that we can do this because it means that we don't have to do so many lookups on the withdrawals. And it's good that we, and we can also use the optimistic payments that we talked about before. Um, yeah, we can also do the optimistic payments that someone can come forward and say, oh, I'll pay for this withdrawal. And all they have to do is set, check a single chain. Yeah, they know that this withdrawal is going to be valid so they can check a single chain and then pay it out. So that works too. Um, Okay, so, so this works for shards between two chains, but we can also do shards with multiple chains. I mean, it's, it's trivial to add more chains to it uh, because, because it's just like another, another batch in the tree, another piece of the tree that we just say, oh, this is for you and this is for you. Another thing that we could do is we could, we could have this kind of, we could like share the data availability between multiple chains. So what we can do is just put like half the transactions here, half the transactions here, half the transactions here. But yeah, yeah, so that should work. But then if we have it, we have to complicate our withdrawal, our, our fork choice rule, because if the, if, the, if the chain diverges and data is available for different states on different chains, we need to, we need to, yeah, so we can have a data availability attack here. We have to have a more complicated fork choice rule, which means we'll probably have to roll back to the last cross link. Possibly, we'll, 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 we'll see. Uh huh. Okay, so what else do I want to say about this? No, I have some more slides about this soon. Okay, so let's talk about the other options. So, so the, the, the thinking is, should we do it with Plasma? And can we do it with state channels? And the answer is yes, we can do it with both. Uh, uh, but uh, possibly we might have a longer withdrawal time for the Plasma with exit game. And the same with state channels. But we can still have this kind of optimistic withdrawal. So yeah, it, it, it depends. I think it will mean that you'll have to have more capital if you're if you're a withdrawer in plasma or in state channels than if you were in in the the roll-up version because you'll just get your money back quicker and you can kind of cycle it through yeah yeah uh oh but there is something cool you might be able to do with state channels where you where you have the fork choice or no actually we can you can do it with the roll-up version too where you have like where if we go back here and if we know that shared one is going to be the is going to be the the chain that we always revert to, then you can withdraw instantly on shared one. Even if you deposit into shared two, you can take it out on shared one because you know that this is like the state. So another thing that we could do is we could create like multiple different connections between two different chains and we can have this kind of super fast transfers between them. So that can work too. Okay, nice. Oh, okay, so we can add more chains and I said earlier that, that this doesn't really have a lot of cost, but actually it does have a lot of cost when, it does have a little bit of cost when you, when you add more and more things. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, so actually, this slide is more about is, is more about adding not adding more shards, but adding more chains. So, let me just talk about this a little bit. So, so we can kind of make that we can kind of say that that a, a cross shard transfer is the same as a cross chain transfer, if we can validate the proof of work on both chains, and if we have logic to 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 lock up coins on one chain and withdraw them on the other. For example, we can't do this with Bitcoin because you can't validate snacks, you can't lock money up with, with this kind of rule, 
and you can validate the proof of work of the other chain. So, so, so what we need to do is validate the proof of work of ether, of ETH, and the proof or the consensus mechanism of, of ETH, and and whatever the, the, the target chain is. Yeah. So we can make these kind of connections between chains if we can do this. Yeah. And we can also validate the proof of work or proof of stake with Snarks, but that's a little bit expensive. Actually, it, it turns out to be less expensive if you have like more advanced Snarks, uh, but the proving time is high and it, it seems to be like a trade-off. Uh, the, like the, recently I looked up, um, what's the Bitcoin uh, relay, Bitcoin relay? And they said that, that oh yeah, so it's like 200,000 gas to validate a proof of work. I think someone talked about it at the conference. Yeah. But, but that's quite expensive, right? I mean, and you need to do that every every 15 minutes to keep up with Bitcoin, and yeah. It can be optimized quite a bit. Oh yeah, oh yeah, you're right. You're right, because it's written in Serpent, right? I, yeah, I thought it was written in Serpent, anyway. Yeah, yeah. so I'm sure, we, I'm sure we could optimize it pretty well, a, a lot more. But anyway, it seems like a good idea to be able to connect to other chains as well. And Snarks have a way to do this that we don't have to do a lot of, lot of work with proof of work. Or yeah, we don't have to do a lot of other hard forks to include it. Okay. Okay, so then there's some kind of questions. How much time do I have left? <laughs> it's alright. Ten. Ten minutes? Okay, let's go. Cool. Okay, so 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 then we can talk a little bit about. Oh yeah, I still have some more slides. It's alright. Um, so then things to think about. All right, so we can do these kind of quick deposits, and we seem to have a way to do quick withdrawals on a certain chain. But it would be nice to have like just a single roll-up that just works across all the chains. Also, it would be nice to have like better trades because in the roll-up that we have at the moment, we can just do atomic swaps. So it would be nice to have like a liquidity pool style system that would that would just help things a little bit. Yeah, that, that would just mean that there's a lot more liquidity in the system and you don't have to worry about these kind of front-running attacks and things like that. Well, you do have to worry about them, but not so much. Okay. Okay, so let's imagine that we, we do this and we, we connect a bunch of chains together. Right? This is not shards, but this is chains. So let's say we connect this to to some other chain, and we uh, and everything is going fine. But then one day, yeah, and then someone wants to add another one, a third chain to our to our set. And this should be we should be able to do this permissionlessly, but it means that we have to spend a lot of our resources on it, right? Because we we are limited in the, in the depth that we can make this Merkle tree. And every time we add another blue box, it, it takes away from the total number of accounts we can have altogether. Uh, so hopefully in the future we'll have more efficient hash functions, which means it doesn't cost so much to make that the tree so deep, but at the moment it costs it costs a little it costs a lot. Um, so there so we need to come up with some mechanism that we can define that lets you add other chains to this system. Uh, yeah. Do I have more? No. Okay, so then I want to talk about a hard fork. So another thing that we should think about doing is that if we have this kind of, if we have a hard fork on one of the, the child chains, we have to come up with a way to to kind of copy the balance for that for the hard fork into, yeah, so we have to make sure that people have the balances for both sides. So this, this be like, okay, so if the chain diverges, uh, people have money on both chains and we want people on both chains to have money. Or we want people to have the money from both chains, right? So this seems like a little bit more difficult. So one thing we could do is just copy the state, the intermediate state root of the chain and say, I, you own it here and you own it here. But then the problem is that we'll have to include that. We'll have to deploy the contract in the new, in the new chain and we'd have to, uh, in the fork chain, we'd have to update the contract in the fork chain to, to sort of point to this as their section of the tree. So that becomes a little bit more difficult. Uh, we would need to have sort of considerations about about like the fork fork ID, the chain ID that, that it's actually on. So that's a little bit more difficult. And I'm, I think that in conter under contentious hard forks, it's more difficult to handle that. But I guess the people who do the actual hard forking should, should, should consider this and include it, possibly. Yeah. And on the ETH side, it's, it's pretty easy. We would just have to add another, another uh, cross chain ID. Okay. Uh, Boom. Done. Okay, yeah, that's it. Uh, let's have some questions. Okay, let's go. This one? Yeah, yeah, yeah this one. Yep. Um, okay, so my question is, um, my guess would be it has to do with trades, but can you talk about why you 
like why you want this property that you're sharing this snark between? Because you're verifying the snark on each truck, right? Yeah. Yeah. Can you talk talk a little bit more about why you desire this property to have one snark sure. on both, as opposed to just doing a snark on the cross link that just sends the money? So you like you mm -hmm. have two separate snarks uh -huh. and then you just use the snark to send it to the other. Okay. So 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 the big reason is that we want to be able to do atomic swaps. Yeah, we want to be able to change. If we're if we're if we're okay to give up, um, if we're okay to give up the the deposits on, on, on it, it, okay, so if we make the, the the time for a deposit much longer, if we say you can only deposit after a cross link, then we don't need to validate on every chain. We just have to validate on the chain that's like the controlling chain. Um, that's the second thing, and the other thing I wanted to say, I can't remember. Um, so can you go through the scenario of uh, what happens if um, there's, say, block um, A1 on shard 1 and B1 on shard 2, and there's a uh, atomic swap between them, and then in the shard 1 fork choice, uh, block A1 gets superseded by A2, but on shard 2 nothing happens and block B1 continues being the dominant block. So like, how do you make sure that the atomic swap doesn't like get half-completed? Oh, because, no, well, the, the atomic swaps don't happen between the chains. The, the atomic swaps happen inside the, in here, right? So the atomic swaps happen here, and we update to, to root one, okay? Wait, so the atomic, sorry, can you go back? Have yeah. atomic swaps happen between who and who? Between, say, Alice and Deborah here. So they, so they do an right, atomic okay, swap. But, but these are still two different shards. Right? No, these are, these are like their, their own kind of unified shard, okay? Because, okay, look at it this way. Alice deposits on chain one. Right. Deborah deposits on chain two. Yeah. We include the, both those deposits and we have root, root one. Okay. Right. This is like the current state. Then Alice and Deborah want to do a, a, an atomic swap, right. so they create their signatures. They do the atomic swap. Mm -hmm. Everything works out. Then we have so root. Then we have root two. A kind of virtual like chain of roots where every root is conditional on two shard blocks. Yeah, depending on the fork choice rule. So, the, so that does mean that if you have a, so where do you store this kind of chain of roots? So like you'd have to store it in one of one shard or the other shard. Right? Yeah. So we should, yeah. So depending on how, how fast you want to do your deposits, we try to, we, we store it on, every, if we want to do quick deposits, we store it on every chain and we validate the snacks on every chain. And if we don't, we want to do. <laughs> right. But no. I mean, like if you have two roots that are stored on like the two, two different sides, and then because of like one shard reorging, but not the other shard reorging, then they contradict each other. Okay, so what happens is that if we have two roots, if we have different roots on, on two different shards, that's like a failure mode, right? And we have, so what happens is we have this kind of fork. Mm -hmm. And what we do is we use our, our kind of cross link to, to revert the fork. Yeah. So basically like you have a rule that says like shard one takes precedence or something. Exactly. Like that. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right, okay, so then theoretically, the actual execution of this new snark, of the snarks, doesn't need to happen immediately. It could be delayed by an arbitrary amount. Yeah, but that would also delay your withdrawals. Yeah? Um, by oh, only a bit, right? By a bit, a bit. Okay, so what you could do is you could wait just before the cross link, yeah. do it, and then, yeah, that would work. Then you can just do the withdrawal. Yeah, I, mean, I guess like if you do a, if you do it early and then it gets reverted, then like you could just set it up so then that's equivalent to that to that snark that got reverted never having been published at all or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So what uh, like so basically I can't trust a withdrawal until I know that like the the official chain like chain one has been included in the cross link, right? So no. No, so you can't trust it until you know the snark has been included in a block there. Yeah. What, what if that chain that then gets reopened? Like okay. Back? Yeah. So you have to you have to wait for finality of the chain, but you don't have to wait for the cross link. Oh. So. How do you get finality without the cross link? Oh, I'm I'm not sure how exactly how how the East 2.0 stuff works, but do you have to wait for a cross link to get finality? Oh, but you can you can do you can say probabilistic things, right? You can say, oh, it's probably not going to. So basically, the idea is then that I I'll accept something from like the system because I can see okay oh, yeah like it looks alright. Like the chains probably not going to get real. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. I have a question for a remote Danny Ryan. Um, uh huh. When referencing fork choice in this scheme, do you mean a modification to the layer one fork choice, or instead a layer two mechanism to alter the state of chart B? With proofs of state of chart A. Layer two. Layer two? Layer two. 
Oh, oh yeah. So another kind of interesting thing that we could do is is that we could have instant withdrawals if we're happy to to sort of withdraw to another snark that we're able to revert. So that, so one of the nice things about this is that it's easy to revert the state of the snark and we don't have to worry about the rest of the chain. So we could come up with like a snark smart contract and put that in a separate a separate kind of instance and withdraw to the snark smart contract under the condition that if we revert if we revert the cross shared snark we also revert this snark. Maybe I'll try and uh, just flesh that out a little bit more in some pictures later. Okay, any other questions? <laughs> yeah, so if, if there's nothing else, just feel free to... Oh, but I want to say thank you to the organizers for doing everything and inviting me. They did a great job. Thank you, organizers. <laughs> That is all for scaling Ethereum. Thank you all for coming again. Um, we hope you will participate in the two working groups. So again, Vitalik will be doing one here on ETH2, Ying Tong and Barry in room 52 on rollups. And if you guys could write up your research or anything tangible to share with people outside of this room, um, that would be awesome. And I think people are looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you.